Our God is a God of new beginnings. So take a deep breath. Let go of yesterday. It is gone. Embrace this day, for it is God's gift to you, and it's the only place where you will be able to find Him. And lift up your heart, and let's discover together how we can find God in each moment, every inch of space and time. And the question I want to ask you today is, what prayer will you pray today? I'll give you two options. One of them I heard for the first time quite a while ago. I was at a conference, tons of people there, and a woman named Anne Lamott was going to speak. Now, Anne Lamott, one of my favorite writers, she is a brilliantly gifted person and a very quirky, unconventional, uh, deeply devoted follower of Jesus. And she was going to speak. The room was just packed with thousands of people, most of them pastors and church leaders. So, And uh, Anne describes herself as an unusually looking person. Uh, skinny, wiry. She didn't think of herself as being photogenic at all. Um, with completely unmanageable hair that she generally just wears in dreadlocks. And dreadlocks are just hard to pull off anytime. Uh, and the more you go through life, the harder they are to pull off. So anyway, we're all gathered there waiting to hear this remarkable person. She steps up to the podium and we wonder what the first remarkable, profound sentence is going to be. And she looks down. There's a monitor down there, which there sometimes is in settings like that, so the speaker can see what they look like. And as soon as she looks down in the monitor, her shoulders sag, and she says, Oh, God, my hair. And the room just went up for about 60 seconds because um, there was something so endearing and self-deprecating about that. But uh, you might just pause for a moment and think, uh, what causes you to say, oh God, when you look in a mirror? Oh, my body, uh, my IQ, my personality, my job, this loss, this relationship, my lack of a job, my anxiety, my depression. And I was thinking afterwards, it's kind of a prayer. It's kind of a lament. Oh God, this part about me I don't like. This thing that I see in me I wish was not there. And that raises the question, of course, what does God see when he looks at you? We're going through Genesis, and this is the most important statement about human beings. We'll come back to this one. God says in Genesis 1 verse 27, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the face of the ground. Now, what's interesting is God sees his image in people. He sees people made in his image and his likeness. And uh, uh, the general idea of that notion of image is in the ancient world, kings would often set up an image, kind of like in our day. Uh, governor of the state might put a picture of herself or himself in the post office to remind everybody, you are under this administration, you are under this rule. And so the idea here is human beings are somehow the representatives of God. It's interesting, as you might know if you're a Bible person, in the Ten Commandments, the second commandment is, you shall not make an image. You won't bow down to it. You won't worship it. Who's the one person who breaks the second commandment? Amazingly enough, it's God. God makes an image of himself and the human beings. A human being is the most sacred object you will ever see. Now, something else unusual, unique in Genesis compared to other ancient origin stories is it's not just the king. Everybody is made in the image of God in this story. That would have profound consequences for human rights and human dignity. In particular, um, well, I'll put this in the form of another question. God says, rule over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, give you all the plants of the ground, creatures of the ground. What is the one part of creation that God does not tell the human beings to rule over? And the answer is each other. God makes human beings in his image, male and female, and tells them to exercise dominion, be responsible for 
um, exercise authority for the good as a servant over all the creation. The one thing he does not say is rule over each other. God did not create human beings to be ruled over. Do you ever wonder, like, like people at work aren't always crazy about having a manager who wants to be managed? You were not made to be managed. Now, understand, we got to do, I have organization at work and so, but God makes people in, uh, in his image, male and female, with a relational capacity for oneness. But he does not say, Hierarchy is built into the human race. He does not say, man, rule over the woman. My wife sometimes says to me, John, reign over me. Never is when she sometimes says, because I wouldn't want her to, and I wouldn't want to say that back. We are not made to be ruled over by human beings. Instead, we are each made to bear the image and the worth of God in this world, in the work that we do. Now, when God looks at you, he sees his image. Do you see that? Because we have this idea of what it means to be a glorious human being. Oh, God, my hair. How glorious does your hair have to be for you to be, bear the image of God? It's a funny thing. There have been lots of movies and lots of portraits of Jesus. You know what I don't ever th think I've seen? I don't think I've ever seen a bald Jesus. He might have been. He was in his early to mid-30s by the time he was crucified. Lots of guys are bald by then. But we have a hard time uh, imagining uh, God as Jesus in human form where it doesn't take on a certain kind of look. And yet, and yet, and yet, somehow what the Bible teaches us is that Jesus is the cruciform image of God. That God is somehow present in some particular way, in those who the world regards as the least of these. The image of God means that you are able to do God's work in the world, to partner together with him. But the image of God at its deepest is not just an attribute and it's not just a function. It is your identity and you can never lose it. And you never don't bear it. John Golden Gate is a great Old Testament scholar, and he's got a commentary on Genesis. And he writes words that are very, very touching when he's writing about this passage in the image of God. My wife, Anne, has multiple sclerosis. She was able to have children, and we brought them up, and she worked as a psychiatrist, but eventually had to abandon her work. She now cannot move at all, hardly even to raise an eyebrow. She cannot do anything for herself or speak. Is she still a person in the image of God? Living with Genesis 1 and Anne's increasing disability leaves me with several reflections. Because handicapped people are indeed human beings made in God's image, the rest of the world owes it to them to seek to make it feasible for them to have as much control over their lives as possible. We should help them master as much of the world as possible rather than take over and run their lives for them. But a kind of converse is that handicapped people remind the rest of us that being unable to work or even do much of anything turns out not to mean you stop being human. Anne is obliged to live a perpetual Sabbath. It is not merely work that defines the image of God. Uh, it, is, it is God himself. There's a remarkable passage that is just uh, uh, very shortly to come in Genesis, Genesis 5. Never noticed this until reading John Goldegay's book. Uh, Genesis 5.1. This is a written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created the male and female and blessed them, named the mankind when they were created. And then it goes on to talk about Adam, because it's going to talk about Adam's line now. When, uh, and then it says, when Adam had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, he named him Seth. Now it uses just the same language. God creates man. He made them in the likeness of God, in his own image. Um, when Adam has a son, he has him in his likeness and his image. In other words, as Adam's child reflects Adam, somehow we reflect God. 
we are made in the image of God because in some strange, amazing, miraculous, wonderful way, we are kin to God. So today, instead of praying, oh God, my hair, oh God, my body, oh God, my inadequacy, oh God, thank you that I bear your image. Oh God, partner with me to do what you're calling me to do today. Oh God, let's do it together. End of teaching beginning of your day with God. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tim. I'm a part of the team here at Become New. If you'd like to receive the emails that go along with each video, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe. Or if you'd like to receive a text alert whenever we release a new video, you can text the word become to the number 855-888-0444. If you have a prayer request, please let us know. You can text that request to that same number, 855-888-0444. There's a group of us who meet every day to pray over those requests. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.